Okay, Dan, you got to come back because um, we can't start this event without taking a selfie with all of our people back here. All right, so here we go. Are you ready? Oh, we're on beauty face. I hate this camera. All right, here, you hold the microphone. Okay. All right, are you ready out there, people? Can you take that for me? Thanks. <laughs> oh, well, good morning. I'm Rebecca Mateer. Um, really, my only credential is that I am Dan Mateer's wife. And uh, so I went to his file cabinet and stole a sermon that he did a long time ago. It was really good. So anyways, um, my beard is itchy this morning. No, I'm kidding. That wasn't your sermon. But I'm excited <laughs> for what God has for all of us here in this room. And I'm really honored and blessed to be here. And, you know, I really love serving Jesus in ministry. I love everything about it. I've loved it from the time I was a little girl. Um, I love being here at these conferences. And there's so much about serving in ministry, whether it's vocationally or in a volunteer role, that is so, so rewarding. So rewarding. But really, there are a lot of roller coaster of emotions serving in ministry and especially in children's ministry. I don't know what it is about children's ministry, but it can make me feel like I am bipolar. Anybody out there? I mean, I can have like the greatest day of my life and there's kids coming and we run this amazing event and then the next day I'm like in the fetal position on the floor like <laughs> only the two pastors kids came, <laughs> right? Those are our kids, honey. Okay. <laughs> I'll never forget our very first, um, our very, one of our first fall festival events. How many of you just finished a, a grand fall festival event? Yes. Holler to you. You've gained 20 pounds. You still have that candy in your house. I know you do. Um, but it was early on in our ministry, and we had just changed churches. We were brand new, uh, kind of learning how to do things. And we were about to do um, a grand fall festival at a church that had a very, very small children's ministry. And so I'll never forget, we had this huge gymnasium, and we did all the things you're supposed to do. We rented the bounce houses when those were still cool. Now we're going to have to come up with something else because everybody has those. And we had all of the orange and the black and the crepe paper and the fishing booth and everything. And we were super excited. And we were so shocked and amazed that like over a thousand people came out to this event. And as young children's pastors, we were like, oh my goodness, we have like nine mangy kids in our kids ministry. This is going to be amazing. And for some reason, I thought that by having these people in our gymnasium that fall festival, that I was going to wake up on Sunday morning and those same people were going to be in our children's ministry the following Sunday. Yeah. yeah? Okay. So I'll never forget, we did this great event. And I went to bed that weekend, and I was super excited. We had handed out all the church bags. We invited the kids back on Sunday morning. I think we even had, like, a little prize for them if they came to one of our services on the weekend. And I remember I, my heart was so excited, and I thought, man, we're really going to grow our church. That was such a successful event. And I'm walking down the stairs to our kids' wing, and I open up the double doors and just... Bam! I get hit in the face with a kickball. <laughs> Kickballs are from the devil. Who is allowing kickballs in children's ministry? Our ceilings aren't tall enough for those. And I remember I got so, it was like such a rude awakening getting hit in the face with this kickball. And it's like I woke up to the reality. There they were, those nine little rugrats. Oh my goodness. I couldn't believe it. Not one visitor from the day, from the weekend before. And I could see, yep, there's Kaylee acting like a cat under the table again. <laughs> there's Timmy jumping off the chairs. There's Lily twirling with her dress over her head. It's going to be a good Sunday. And, you know, this roller coaster of emotions that we can go through in ministry, it's amazing how we can go from one day being a mighty visionary. You know, you meet with a team, you have a great vision, you feel this excitement rise up in your heart. 
And just a few weeks can go by, and you know the enemy can just steal that away. And you feel so low and just, ah, where are the volunteers? And why am I even here? And why am I serving? This roller coaster of emotions. Or sometimes we can go feeling like we're so connected with our team. We feel like we have friends all around us. We feel like we're having coffee with people and we're cool. And we come to these things and we're like, I met so many people at this event. It was awesome. And then we go home and we have those days where we're like, I know nobody. <laughs> you know, you don't know anybody. And you can go from feeling known to feeling completely unknown in our life. This roller coaster of emotions. But there's nothing quite like being here at a conference with each other. And what a cool event that we can come and share who we are. All of you get it. You know, you get the kickball in the face. You get when the, the kids are doing well and when they're not. You get the importance of a kid giving their life to Christ. You get the stories. You get each other. The, the problem, though, is we leave these conferences feeling encouraged, feeling built up in the Lord, and then we can go right back into a rut of feeling insecure and self-aware and feeling like, why am I here or like Al spoke about last night, feeling like I can't get to the calling that I feel like God has placed on my life. And we leave sometimes feeling like nobody really knows who we really are. Nobody knows who we really are. Sometimes when I come to these events, um, you know, everybody knows my husband, Dan. But I can go to this conference or really any conference under the sun and I immediately turn into a junior hire. I leave, and our conversation is, oh, why didn't I give them my number? Man, <laughs> like, I, I wish I had given somebody's number or, like, that I had connect, connected better with somebody. Like, I don't know, you want to, like, hang out on Facebook sometime? Or <laughs> never mind. <laughs> I know you're busy. You have a lot of people. Like, I kind of wish that we gave out yearbooks at these things so I could just nonchalantly be like, stay cool forever. Call me sometime. <laughs> Bye. And, like, actually, that's how I met my husband. I literally wrote my name in his yearbook and said, call me, stay cool forever. I think that's what I said. And he did call me, and we're married now. So yearbooks work, and you need to give somebody your phone number and tell them stay cool forever. So I, um, <laughs> when, when uh, Brent and the team asked me to come speak, they gave me this topic of staying connected and not doing ministry life alone. And I was thinking, I'm a liar. I'm connected only on Facebook, and that's a fake world. I'm sitting here with my kids, and I don't even hang out with anybody. And I wish that um, I could give you, you know, five amazing steps of how to stay connected and not do ministry life alone. But the only thing that I can truly tell you this morning is speak from a deep revelation of what Jesus had spoken to me just a little while back that so revolutionized the way I saw not only myself, but the way I saw people when I would walk into a room kind of like this one. You know, secretly, um, I hate people. So um, <laughs> these events are hard, you know. I don't know about you, but... I don't like needy people. Do you guys know, you know the needy people when they walk in the room and they're going to have a conversation with you. And the worst thing is when you're somewhere and you've got plenty of time, it's like your day off. Has this ever happened when the phone rings and oh my goodness, it's Patty and you don't want to have a two hour conversation. So you're like, I'll, I'll get that later. So you go to swipe it, but you swipe the wrong way and you realize you answer the call and then you're like, oh, uh, oh, hi. Oh, Patty. Oh, yeah, we talked three hours on Sunday. Yes. Oh, let's, I, yep, I have time for you right now. And we're, you know, you go on with the conversation, and inside you're just dying. You wish you could just hang up. You're telling your spouse, eh, 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 like, you know, from the side. <laughs> liars. We're such liars, you know. And we pretend that we want to be connected, but we have a fear of needy people, Right. And sometimes I think to myself, maybe the reason it's difficult for me to have an honest friendship or connect with my team or connect in ministry on a real authentic level is because I don't want to be needy. 
You see, I hate being messy. I want to have it all together. You know, the jeans I'm wearing, they give a roll right now, and I don't like that. You know, honestly, sometimes, you know, I, I want to be all put together and perfect, and I don't want to be needy. I just want to put my best foot forward and, and have people see the best of me, and that's why I'm addicted to Facebook. So that's what we're going to spend the rest of our time on this morning. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> but we don't want to be needy, and we don't want to be messy, and in fact, we don't even want to be dependent on somebody else. We learn, of course, as we accept Jesus that we're supposed to be dependent on Jesus. But, you know, that kind of dependence, that's got to look different than it does in the body of Christ, right? But no. You see, even our world and our nation, um, of course, for other reasons, but we have an Independence Day and we celebrate being independent. We celebrate being able to do it on your own and to rise up and be a good leader and lead a team, but don't need a team. Don't need anybody, right? We don't want to be dependent. We don't want to be needy. But God has designed us to be people who are deeply needy and deeply dependent, deep into our core. Yeah. And sometimes I wonder if we despise the design of God. I want to read this psalm to you, Psalm 62, 5 through 9. It says this. I depend on God alone. I put my hope in him. He alone protects and saves me. He is my defender, and I shall never be defeated. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my strong protector. He is my shelter. Trust in God at all times, my people, and tell him all your troubles, for he is our refuge. Human beings are all like a puff of breath. Great and small alike are worthless. Put them on the scale, and they weigh nothing. They are lighter than a mere breath. That is our identity, to be deeply dependent on God, to be deeply in need of him, and to be in need of one another. I think that um, this fear sometimes of not wanting to connect with others comes from a misconstrued idea that we have as pastors, as leaders. Um, even when we get ordained as a minister, and even though this is very biblical and I do honor this, they, they come up to the front and they give you a shepherd's staff as a way of saying, you're about to go lead the flock. But I tell you what, you cannot be a shepherd until you are first and foremost a sheep. And let me tell you something about sheep. I lived in England my first year of university and went to Bible school there. And we lived in this castle on this farm with all of these sheep. And sheep are not cute. They're not the flannel graph, little white fluffy things with the pink ears. They're super gross. They sound like this. <laughs> right? Their eyes bug out of their heads and their slobber gets in their hair and it's all matted and they reek. And this is who we are. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> Messy, flawed, blah. Like you could just go around to your team when you make a, a stupid decision or, you know, go around to people when you are just having a difficult day. Or, you know, instead of telling your husband the whole story, just say, blah. He'll get it, you know? But this is who we really are. Needy and in need of a shepherd. And I think we've been confused, even as pastors and as leaders and as people who are leading other people, that I am a shepherd and I am wearing a white robe and I have the staff in hand. If you wear a white robe in secret, we can have counseling later. But honestly, who we are and who we will always be are sheep. And, you know, it's funny for me to talk about sheep because I'm sure that you have given many lessons in your children's ministry about sheep at some time or another. But it wasn't until I was, ha I was on vacation and there was this day I was just feeling bitter in my spirit. I was annoyed with our family. Now this was extended family, not you, babe. <laughs> so annoyed with the family and I just, in my spirit, I was just stewing. And the Lord 
called me away for a little moment, and we, I went down to uh, the river there. There was like this little dock, and I sat down, and you know, I'm just kind of flipping in the Bible, and I come upon the 23rd Psalm. And so I begin to read it, and this is, I'm like, the Lord is my shepherd, yada, yada, yada. And like, I totally pulled a Seinfeld. You can't yada, yada the 23rd Psalm, <laughs> right? <laughs> But I was. I, I was like, I've read this so many times. I could quote this scripture as a pastor's daughter and a pastor's wife and being in ministry all of my life. What does the 23rd Psalm have to offer me? Except the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. And I began to read that scripture, and the Lord stopped me halfway through, and he said, what would this very passage look like if it were written down line by line with you not being a sheep? with you living your life the exact opposite and in the antithesis of the 23rd Psalm. And God began to do such a radical change in me that he would change me from the inside out. You see, before I can talk to you about being connected with other people in this room or in your churches or friends that are real authentic that you love and who know you, I can't talk to you about that until I talk to you about some deep, rooted issues that we have as human beings who don't want to be dependent and who say that we can do it on our own and don't want to look messy and flawed. So I want us to um, uh, read the 23rd Psalm together, if you would. Um, so I'm going to read that. And if you guys would, it's up here. It's kind of small, but you guys have memorized it. I already know that. So <laughs> just kidding. You don't know it. Um, Let's read it together, though, together. Here we go. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This entire scripture of who I really am, somebody in need of a shepherd, Somebody in need of comfort, it said, that he would comfort me. Somebody in need of rest. Somebody in need. And I began to read through that scripture with this deep self-awareness that I didn't want to need anybody in my life. You see, in fact, throughout all of our ministry and just different times in my life, I have really struggled with anxiety I come into a room and, you know, it's just awkward, right? To be like, how you doing? How's your ministry going? You hope the conversation is short and sweet and to the point, and you get on with your life. And, you know, sometimes I just have that anxious feeling, and then you finally get back to, to quiet where you can be you, and it's just like, ah. But I remember when the Lord said to me this, and if you've ever heard me spoke before, you've heard me say this before because it was so life-changing for me, but that Anxiety is the daughter of pride. You see, this is what happens. We love Jesus. We want to serve him. We're talented. You guys are cool people. You're doing awesome things. And we get to a point where we're walking in our own strength and we're pretty proud. And this is where the enemy takes on a completely different face in our life. And he says, good job. Way to go. You're doing awesome. And then all of a sudden, Something goes wrong, and the bottom begins to fall out, and you go from feeling dependent, and I was feeling really good, and yeah, God, you were there, and I was high-fiving you, and, and now I'm not so sure, and I, I'm not qualified for this, and things aren't going well, and I'm struggling with my boss, and I'm feeling insecure, and all of a sudden, fear starts to come in. And then when fear sets in, we keep trying to strive in our own ability, and wait, but I'm good enough, and you know, it's okay, and fear comes in, and Fear then gives birth to anxiety, and anxiety can really cripple a person in your life. And it, you may not be have, have been crippled by that in your life, but you may be the product of 
living your life so much that you're just kind of, you know, you're beyond anxiety to the point where you're numb now. And I wonder how many of you in this very room are doing ministry and you're doing life and you're serving Jesus and you're worshiping and maybe you're like me and you've gone through a season or you're in a season where you have zero emotion left. You don't feel anything for the Lord anymore. You're not passionate about his word. You've forgotten his love for you. And I'm wondering if you're standing there with the shepherd's staff in your own hand and it's time for you to give that staff back to the Lord and say, God, oh, I'm just a mess. Lord, forgive me of my pride. And I didn't realize that in a broken, needy place, the thing that I needed to do most was repent. And that didn't make sense to me. I thought, God, I'm the one that's depressed. I'm the one that's down. I'm the one that doesn't have any vision anymore. And I had to come to a place of repentance and say, Jesus, forgive me. God, I remember who I am as I read this 23rd Psalm. I'm somebody in need, in need of a Savior. You see, that scripture says, he makes me lie down, and he leads me to quiet waters. And if you're a go-getter like me, you don't want to lay down, and there's no time for quiet waters. We're busy, and we got lots to do. It says that he's going to restore us. Well, we don't have time to be restored. That's for messed up people who need counseling. But I've got God. I'm good, right? I don't need to be restored. I'm in the business of helping other people get restored. And we live out these lies of, of independence in our lives. And this was my attitude in my life. Until that day when the Lord began to take me through that 23rd Psalm, recognizing my independence, my unwillingness to need anybody truly, to not be able to be connected in ministry. And in fact, it was easier for me to do ministry alone. And so this is what my life looked like. And I'm going to read to you what the Lord had put on my heart that day. It is the complete antithesis of the 23rd Psalm. And I wonder if there will be a line in here that would resonate with you. And unfortunately, it was every line in this for me. So here I go the antithesis of the 23rd Psalm. I am my own caretaker. I can never provide enough, and I am always in need. I lie down as if on an anthill, and I am overwhelmed. I lead myself into chaos, and my life is chaotic. I am frail and broken, and there is little hope of healing. My soul has become calloused. I stand paralyzed on a lonely path, although nobody knows it. I am exhausted by my own insecurity because my thoughts are consumed with self. I am walking in the middle of disaster and I see no way out. I have made my home in the valley of death and I am at a constant funeral over the losses in my life. I am fearful and worried. I am rejected, abandoned, and powerless. No one is with me, even when they say they are. I am at a table surrounded by the enemy and I am soul sick from his torment. Shame is poured out over my head, and I wear uselessness like a crown of weeds. My cup is empty, and I am always drained. I live with a constant void. Calamity, frustration, and misunderstanding are the imprints I seem to leave with people. Emptiness follows my every step. I am trapped in a spinning cycle of self-focus, and at the house of God, I peer through the window like an orphan who is not invited in. You see... That day was a real wake-up call for me. That the reason that I couldn't do what Brent had asked me to do, speak on staying connected with people and thriving in relationships and not doing ministry life alone, was for this very reason. Because I didn't want to be needy. I didn't want to be messy. I mean, isn't that what the Christian life is after all? You know, we accept Jesus and we, we have this great victory in our lives and we're never messy again. No, that's not it, right? You know that. But really, truly accepting this place. And the Lord allowed me to write uh, a book about this. It's called The Fruit of Where I Dwell. And I remember that it wasn't till the very end of writing, and this is actually not too long ago, um, I was writing at the very end and there was a, a reflection page in there and I was kind of going through some edits and it said, take a minute just to visualize Jesus as your shepherd. And so I closed my eyes and I remember I was rushing out because there was like a Bible study that morning and, 
And I closed my eyes and I could see the sheep <laughs> like bounding around. And I'm looking, I'm looking kind of all over in my, in my head, but I couldn't see the shepherd. And then I, all of a sudden it dawned on me, oh my gosh, Lord, I'm the shepherd. I've been the shepherd of my own life all this time, and I'm afraid to be a sheep. I don't like sheep. They're ugly and messy, and I never wanted to be a sheep. I only ever wanted to be a shepherd. I honored that position. And I wanted to lead people, and I wanted people to follow me. And as embarrassing as it was, yes, I wanted them to follow Christ, but follow me first. Right? The sickness of my soul that day. And I had one of these super creepy things happen to me. I reached down into my purse as I kind of like, this revelation hit me, and I said out loud, today, Jesus, I identify myself as a sheep. And I reached down in my purse, and someone had given me a gift the weekend before that. And I I felt it as I was reaching for my keys, and I opened it up, and it was a pair of sheep earrings. Who gives sheep earrings? It's the worst gift ever. It's like from Grandma on Christmas Day. I was like, I'm never wearing these. But it was such, I mean, for me, it was such a big deal. I put those sheep earrings in my ears just like a sheep would be branded. You know, they have those tags on them. And I said, Jesus, today I identify myself as a sheep in need. And if my eyes are bugging out of my head, so be it. Blah, blah, blah. That's who I am. And I remember I went to Bible study that morning, and um, the lady who was leading Bible study is an artist. In fact, a lot of her art is at Costco and on the tins and everything. And she's, she's, she's a brilliant artist. And I was walking down the hallway to use her restroom, and her art room door was open. And right in front of me, on that easel, was the truest version of a sheep's head you could possibly imagine painted on canvas. And she heard me kind of gasp down the hallway. I was like, ah, right? (laughs) There I am. (laughs) You drew my portrait. I mean, it was like, it was true. It was like the sheep eyes and the matted hair and the tongue and everything. And I said, what in the world is this doing here? And why am I wearing sheep earrings? And I need help, right? And so she said, oh, yeah, really weird. Some people wanted some pillows in Texas with a sheep on it. So I just finished that. And I began to tell her the story and that today I identify myself as a sheep. And she took her original painting off of that easel, and she handed it to me and said, this is for you. And really, in my life and ministry, this was a catalyst for me to be able to see other people and see myself for who I really am, messy and needy and belonging to a good shepherd. I wrote this that morning as I realized that I didn't want to be a sheep, and I think we have a slide of it. It starts with, I don't like sheep. But this is what I wrote. I don't like sheep. I don't don't like that they look ugly when they are sheared and that their eyes bug out of their heads. I don't like the way they eat. Their chewing of the cud is disgusting to me. Me, 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 a sheep. Ew, 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 a you. And yet Jesus draws these sheep into their destination. He brings them into green pastures. They enjoy the luxury of the land. They thrive in their surroundings. They follow easily. They live in community, learning from one another. They stay close to the shepherd. They run away from the sound of wolves. They enjoy one another. They live in protection, provision, and security. They accept their identity. They listen well. They depend with ease. And the peace they have is desirable to me, 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 a sheep, you, 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 a you. You see, in order for you and I to be able to connect with anybody on any kind of an authentic level, we have to recognize that the people that sit right now shoulder to shoulder with you are just in much in need of any help as you could ever be. And I don't want you to disregard the cool people that stand up here leading in worship, beautiful people who are talented, also know what it's like to be a sheep. And some of them, some of the people that maybe, I'm not saying I judge you, sorry. (laughs) But you know what I mean? We judge people. 
by how talented they are and how beautiful, and it's a little bit like Punchinello, if you know the story. And I just want us to take a good look at who we really are, and I want us to recognize that the person that you sit shoulder to shoulder with might be in some of the deepest pain of their life, and you have no idea. Some of you are walking through identical crisis in your life. Some of you are walking through great joys, and you need somebody to share that with also in your life. I um, had a, a really another life-changing moment as it relates to this. I was headed to an event to speak, and I was so anxious as I always would get, and I, I was driving, and I, I'm singing in the car, and I'm praying out loud, and I'm asking for God's anointing, and my hands are kind of shaking on the wheel. I can feel my stomach in knots, and I just thought that was par for the course. That's just how people feel when they get up to public speak, right? The two worst fears in the world, death and public speaking. And I thought, well, that's just it, right? This is a normal reaction to speaking in front of peers, right? And the Lord said this to me as I'm praying for anointing and praying for peace and asking him to take all the stomach sickness away that I wouldn't throw up on the stage and I wouldn't look ridiculous and they wouldn't regret inviting me to come. And the Lord said this to me, quit looking for the head table. That's all he said. Quit looking for the head table. And as I pondered that in my spirit, I recognized that every time I go to speak somewhere or every time we go to lead somewhere, we're always looking over our shoulder for that one important person who's going to pat us on the shoulder and give us an accolade. And I don't know about you, but I had a terrible habit of people coming up to me, and I know you've been the recipient of this, where you're trying to say hi to somebody, and they're not even looking at you. They give you one glance and go, hi, yeah, <laughs> and they're waving at other people, right? And they're not even seeing you at all. Have you ever had that happen to you? That happens a lot, because we're distracted people. But the Lord said, quit looking for the head table. You see, the head table is the place where all the special people sit where you hope you'll belong someday, or maybe you already do belong there. It's the one that's reserved, special seating. It's the front row here, right? The place where we don't always feel like we belong, but we desire to belong. And the Lord said to me, I want you to go into that center, that church, and the very first person you see without judgment, I don't care if she's dressed to the nines or if she's wearing a Winnie the Pooh jacket with a perm, Whoever it is, I want you to reach out and love her and really listen. And so I walked in that day, and I saw one person, and the Lord said, that's all you get. You don't get to know everybody in the room. You don't get to, to be a busy bee and meet everybody and, and be so glad that they invited you because you met a 1,000 people, but you left empty. He said, you get to meet one. So I went in that day with a, just a knowing that Jesus was speaking to me, and I met this beautiful woman, and we sat down together, and she didn't know who I was, and I didn't know who I was. And we sat down, and she said, yeah, actually, it's my first time here, and I'm a single mom as of recently. My husband just left me, and I found this event at the community center. It was on the bulletin board, and I thought I would just come just to get out of the house, and we laughed about how how difficult it was to get out of the house and with all the laundry and the mess. And, and I just asked her question after question, and she asked me questions. You see, you can't just be a good question asker. You've got to tell about your own life, too. You've got to let the mess out and relate and be together. And by the end of that night, I knew Melissa well. And then the night started. I don't even think I had time to check my microphone. And I came up. And I tell you what, all of that fear and anxiety, all of that self-focus that just so eat me up inside, the kind that when you walk into this room, you can't connect with anybody because you're so self-consumed, it fell to the ground in the name of Jesus. Because for the first time ever, I saw somebody, and then I saw myself in their face. I saw myself in their pain. And I could relate. And I wasn't the counselor. I wasn't the pastor. I wasn't the one who knew it all. I was just the one who could relate. And that's when all of that self-reliance falls to the ground in our lives. 
So I want to end with a challenge to us at this event. We're not done with fusion, but we have an opportunity to not meet everybody in the room. We have an opportunity to meet a few people and meet them well. And that's what I want to encourage you to do because we have worn a badge, honestly, in our hearts that we don't need people. And some of you feel like you already know too many people. You can't take on another person. But not even that is authentically you. And so I just want to pray some prayers over us because I want the Lord to help us recognize that who we are are people in need of community and one another. But it wasn't until I dealt with the root of my own pride, my own shepherd staff that I needed to relinquish control, my own reality of who I really am, my own antithesis psalm where I recognized how I really felt about the church and ministry and people, that God began to do something new in my life so that I could really know somebody, so that I could really have a friend outside of Facebook, so that I could really have coffee with somebody and enjoy it and not try to fit it in the day. And this is who we are. Sheep, shoulder to shoulder. Nobody better than anybody else, not putting anybody on a pedestal, just the honest us being loved by a mighty, mighty God who became a sheep for us, ugly and bleeding with his eyes, bugged out of his head, right? And then became our God who isn't like us, right? He is our God. And so I want to invite the worship team to come back, and I want to pray over us today over every single one in this room, that God would help us minister from a deeper place than we've been ministering before. Maybe today God would just bring you to an awareness that you've just been shallow connecting for too long, and the Lord wants you to really connect with somebody. Or maybe you're also crippled by this insecure feeling when you come into a room like this. And maybe the Lord would allow that just to break off in the name of Jesus. And you could just say, all I am is a sheep. And that person that I judge or that person that seems too cool for me or that one that can wear skinny jeans and I can't, right? You look at them and you say, you know what? They're just sheep too. And if I would just break through the facade, they've got something that maybe they, we could share on. Maybe we could meet Jesus together. And we've learned to love Jesus again. Learn to love him in our spirit, in our soul, in our mind. So as the band plays, this is what I want to do. I want to pray that God would break off what I call a lone shepherding syndrome. That you would shepherd alone. And that God would allow you to reach out and need somebody else. To, to appreciate your team on a whole new level. To really need them and lead them as a sheep to a shepherd, that you are all that together. So I'm wondering if everyone in this room would just stand to their feet because I want to pray a prayer of blessing and anointing that each and every one of you would minister from a place that maybe you've been lacking. And for those of you who have felt so numb in your spirit and you're tired of doing the job you're doing, but you can't tell anybody that, otherwise you'll lose your job, right? Maybe today's a divine appointment for you. That Jesus would bring your spirit back to life. That you would recognize the love of Jesus. That he is our shepherd leading us to quiet places and filling our cup. That he is the God who gives and gives. And he's not a taking God like maybe some of us have known him to be. So I'm just going to pray a prayer of blessing over these places in your life. And ask that God would help you to really minister from the depth of who you know yourself to be. And then it would be a new season of being able to minister on a whole new level as you quit looking over your shoulder and quit looking for the head table and start doing ministry the way Jesus did it. Really, truly, all about sheep. So, Jesus, I love you, God. Lord, and I stand up here as somebody who has been so confused Lord, that I have honored above all else this idea that I was a shepherd and, God, I forgot to recognize myself as a sheep. And today I pray over your people in this room 
I pray, Jesus, that we would begin to identify ourselves as sheep truly and that there wouldn't be shame in that. But, Lord, we would begin to minister more effectively than we've ever ministered before. God, I pray that we would truly be known, Lord, and in, in children's ministry where it's so easy to hide, so easy to know the kids but not be known. I pray, Jesus, that this group of people, myself included, would be known better than we've ever been known before, that we would know one another and love one another and see you for who you are today. God, I pray that you would heal us from the deepest place of our need this morning. And God, we thank you for the freedom that comes by recognizing who we really are. And God, we repent this morning. Forgive us, Lord, for holding on to that shepherd's staff, for trying to control it all. And God, we just say, you are the shepherd, Lord. And we need one another in this community. We rejoice in your design. Forgive us for despising it, Jesus. We thank you for the work you're doing, and we worship you now in Jesus' name. Let's just worship the Lord together this morning.